all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another deeper dive into the archive. Today we're going back to sea to explore the remarkable story of a traditionally built full rigged sailing ship named Bounty. Based on the plans of her famous predecessor, HMS Bounty, arguably the most famous British ship in the world, the new Bounty was built to be one of the stars of the 1962 movie Mutiny on the Bounty. Also starring Marlon Brando, Trevor Howard, and Richard Harris, the movie was considered to be a critical and financial flop, though it was the fifth highest grossing movie of 1962. Still, that was far from enough. Costing $19 million to make, it only made $13 million, and required $30 million to make a profit. Still, there was the ship and its story, but before I get to it, including its more than 40 years as a popular Florida attraction, I'll cover a bit of the backstory. I'll assume you're somewhat familiar with the incredible mutiny on the bounty. The 1962 movie doesn't follow history very well, but there's little point in covering all that on a channel about Florida history. Basically, Bounty left Britain en route to Tahiti in 1789. She failed to pass around Cape Horn at the tip of South America and was forced to head past Africa into the Indian Ocean and on to Polynesia. She reached Tahiti after a 10-month voyage. Spending five months at the island, they left with more than a thousand breadfruit plants for the West Indies. Breadfruit, which is related to mulberries, was to be grown as a cheap source of food for slaves on sugar plantations. The mutiny happened in April 1789, and Bounty would eventually head to remote Pitcairn Island where it'd be burned to both avoid detection and prevent anyone from leaving the island. Bounty's captain, Lieutenant William Bly, and the men who stayed loyal to him were set adrift in a launch merely 23 feet or 7 meters in length with little chance of survival. Yet survive they did. After a harrowing 4,000 mile or 6,500 kilometer voyage that took 48 days. Frankly, the story of that trip would make a terrific movie. Bly made it back to Britain, though it was nearly two and a half years after he'd left. He'd eventually be promoted to Vice Admiral in the Royal Navy and also served as Governor of New South Wales. He died in 1817 at the age of 63. As for the 19 mutineers, three were executed for the mutiny, three drowned when the ship taking them to trial sank, eight were murdered, mostly by islanders who they had abused, and one committed suicide. Only one, John Adams, lived past Bly, dying on Pitcairn in 1829 at the age of 61. By the way, Bly's governorship in New South Wales ended with another mutiny of sorts. The locals hated his confrontational style and successfully rebelled against him, sending him to Tasmania. Now that I've gotten the grisly details out of the way, on with the story that begins 171 years after that historic mutiny. There's some interesting similarities between the two bounties beyond the obvious. Both begin their missions with a good deal of optimism. The missions end up being less than successful, though the ships perform admirably. They wind up in an unexpected port, and they both have unfortunate ends. This is one of the greatest stories of a classic Florida attraction. Most people know of three bounty movies. Indeed, many websites talk about them, but that's not the correct number. There's actually five movies. The other two were Australian productions. The first, a silent film titled The Mutiny of the Bounty, that was made in 1916. Sadly, there are no known copies of that movie. The second, In the Wake of the Bounty, was released in 1933 and starred a young Australian named Errol Flynn in his film debut as head mutineer Fletcher Christian. I wonder whatever happened to him. Just two years after, Mutiny on the Bounty would be the third telling of the infamous event. It starred Charles Lawton and Clark Gable as Bly and Christian and was a huge success. The critics loved it, it was the most popular movie of 1935, and it won the Oscar for Best Picture. 
By the way, this would be the first year the Academy Award would be known as Oscar, a name whose source is still unknown to this day. Next, we head to 1984 and The Bounty, the fifth retelling starring Anthony Hopkins and Mel Gibson as Bly and Christian. This movie would follow the narrative of the actual history of the mutiny and the events surrounding it. The movie got mixed reviews. While the accuracy was praised, the movie fell short and was described as bland and predictable. It also lost money. Anthony Hopkins had later commented that it was such a sad mess of a film, such a botched job. Unfortunately, that was the second of the films which failed to make a profit. The 1962 Mutiny on the Bounty, like the rest, was at least beautifully filmed. Not to take anything from the skill of cinematographer Robert Surtees, but the film's backdrop included the stunning islands of Polynesia and a highly photogenic ship. Surtees was a three-time Oscar winner, who was the director of photography for many movies including Ben-Hur, The Graduate, Oklahoma, The Sting, and one of my favorites, The Great Waldo Pepper. The new bounty story begins in 1960 in the small Nova Scotia port of Lunenburg. The Hollywood movie studio Metro-Golden-Mare commissioned the shipbuilder Smith and Ruland to make a replica for their upcoming movie. Bounty was the first large ship built from scratch for a film using historical sources. Smith and Rulin would build her using traditional means, though she'd also have to employ some modern requirements, including two John Deere diesel engines to assist the three masts and 14 sails. She cost MGM $750,000, which is about $8 million in 2023. Using files from the British Admiralty archives, some 200 workers labored for eight months to build the remarkable craft. While the deck of the original bounty was 91 feet long and 24 feet wide, the new bounty was greatly expanded at 120 and 32 feet. This nearly doubled the cubic dimension of the ship. When finished, Bounty's spars and rigging stood out in black shrouds against the sky, and her dark blue hull curved gracefully from stern to bowsprit. The windows of her stern cabin glowed yellow at night, and the figurehead, a great lady in riding habit, seemed to lift her skirts with one hand while gripping her riding crop with the other as the ship rose and fell in the sea. Its complement was 26 sailors, while the much smaller original boasted 44 officers and men. This was required as there were sailors allocated to each of the three masts so that furling and unfurling the sails could be done simultaneously. In case of a sudden squall, the ship might be in danger if canvas weren't taken in with dispatch. With the addition of diesel engines, Bounty didn't need the extra crew. Bounty set sail, a phrase that could be taken quite literally, in October 1960 and headed to the Panama Canal, which provided quick access to the Pacific in a way that was far safer than navigating around Cape Horn. For 30 days, Bly's bounty was prevented from entering the Pacific at the tip of South America by fierce storms. That forced him to take his ship on the safer but far longer passage eastward. By December 3rd, she reached Tahiti. With engines assisting the sails, New Bounty had a quick voyage that took a little over a month. The 1789 voyage took 10 months, but New Bounty didn't have that much time. Filming of the movie in Tahiti had already begun, but due to construction delays, the ship was two months late to the project. Eventually, Bounty did join the rest of the cast and played its part. The larger size of the ship was incorporated for good reasons. Once filming began, Bounty would need to carry all the production staff as well as allow for better filming opportunities when the production needed to shoot on deck or below. More room meant that lights and cameras could move around more easily. 
The huge cameras were filled with 65 millimeter film to produce the widescreen format movie. One of the movie-related items in the archive is a wonderful full-color souvenir book. The book's 34 pages detail the making of the movie and the history of the mutiny. At the end of filming, the ship was due to be put to the torch to illustrate the unfortunate end of the original bounty, set alight at Pitcairn. Happily, this was skipped when Marlon Brando suggested to MGM that they use her to promote the movie. By the way, there was another interesting tie between the 18th century voyage and the modern one. The mutineers would take Tahitian women with them as they fled to Pitcairn. Meanwhile, one of the new bounties Nova Scotian crew met and subsequently fell in love with one of the islanders. At the end of filming, as Bounty sailed back to North America, the young lady flew to Nova Scotia to meet with her new husband and start a life far removed from the tropical one to which she was accustomed. Bounty embarked on a worldwide tour and then headed to Queens, New York. For six months in both 1964 and 65, the New York World's Fair would be the biggest event in the world. It'd also be the second one held not only in New York, but on Flushing Meadows in Queens. She was moored at the World's Fair Marina, located near newly built Shea Stadium and on Flushing Bay. While she was part of the fair and listed in the guidebooks, she was separated from the fairgrounds by a railroad line, baseball stadium, and parkways, as well as a two-thirds of a mile or one kilometer hike. Bounty cost 90 cents for adults and 50 cents for kids to tour. Once the World's Fair was over, Bounty headed south for the winter along with tens of thousands of other New Yorkers. The five-year-old ship made her new home in St. Petersburg, one of Florida's primary havens for snowbirds and retirees. Opening in 1965, MGM's Bounty attraction included each of the other sites of the World's Fair attraction, such as a recreation of Bly's launch and a Tahitian outrigger. One other group of items that traveled with Bounty were postcards that had been for sale at the fair. The same cards were available in St. Pete, with the description on the back changed from the location at the fair to that in Florida. Known officially as MGM's Bounty Exhibit, the attraction was one of Florida's smallest in size, occupying a space just under an acre along a seawall in the Vinoyne Basin. It joined several other nearby attractions, including Sunken Gardens, Tiki Gardens, London Wax Museum, and the Aquatarium, making Pinellas County a major Florida tourism area, much like Silver Springs, Lake Wales, and Miami. Touring the ship was a wonderful experience for everyone. There was a great attention to detail both in Bounty's construction and the various equipment and appointments placed above and below decks. In the hold, there were cutaway walls that provided a glimpse into the cabins, galleys, and cargo holds that allowed for people to understand life at sea in the 18th century. The steps that led to the different levels were steep as they would have been in the original bounty, and the rooms were finished with traditional materials such as wood and brass. One of bounty's displays was the teleopticon. As a brochure describes it, here you can sit in a native hut similar to the one used by mutineers 200 years ago and see and hear the exploits of bounty during her voyages around the world. The teleopticon is nearly forgotten 60s technology, a television optical projector that showed photos and artwork. Think of it as a cinematic slideshow which included sound, film, and images to tell Bounty's story. On the ship itself, the displays were enhanced by the working sounds of the 18th century British Navy as well as the words of Bounty's famous sailors. Curiously, MGM chose to use recordings from the 1935 mutiny on the bounty, not from the one that the ship was built for. As the brochure further described, 
As you roam where once mighty men worked and lived, you'll hear the voices of Clark Gable and Charles Lawson speak the words of Fletcher Christian and Captain Bly that led to the most famous mutiny in maritime history. It's unclear as to why this was done. MGM held the rights to both movies, but was it because their first bounty movie was the most successful and popular, or was it because someone like Marlon Brando argued against it? The bounty exhibit operated year-round until 1985. It would be at that point that the MGM Film Library and Bounty were sold to media entrepreneur Ted Turner. After that point, Bounty would only visit St. Pete in wintertime. Now, if you're familiar with the Tampa Bay area, you're aware that it's well known for the home of another famous sailing ship, the Jose Gasparilla, also a modern-built ship and one that's the star of Tampa's annual Gasparilla Festival, a celebration of the fictional pirate Jose Gaspar. I've always thought it was a shame that Bounty never fought a pitched battle against the Jose Gasparilla. St. Pete and Tampa are cross-bay rivals, and it would have been tremendous if the two great sailing ships fought in Tampa Bay. The handsome pirate ship, dueling against the noble British ship of the line, would have garnered national attention and been a way for the two cities to come together, at least for a day. Like other movie stars, Bounty appeared in several films over the years, playing different roles. There was Yellowbeard, the 1983 movie written by Graham Chapman and his life partner David Sherlock. Chapman also starred as Yellowbeard, a ruthless pirate who spent the movie attempting to retrieve treasure he had stolen from the Spanish. The movie featured a who's who of comedy performers such as Chapman, Eric Idle, and John Cleese, all from Monty Python, along with Peter Cook, Peter Boyle, Peter Bull, Cheech and Chong, Madeline Kahn, Marty Feldman, and Susanna York, plus James Mason and David Bowie. There were three ships in the film portrayed by Bounty. Treasure Island was a 1990 made-for-television film adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's 1883 novel of the same name. It was written and directed by the son of Charlton Heston, Fraser Heston. It starred Charlton Heston as Long John Silver and included Christian Bale, Oliver Reed, and Christopher Lee. Bounty was renamed Hispaniola, the ship that took the treasure seekers to the eponymous island. In the novel, the island was known as Skeleton Island, but who'd want to go there? The SpongeBob SquarePants movie, an animated film from 2004, saw Bounty appear during the opening, featuring pirates singing the SpongeBob theme song as Bounty takes them to a theater to watch the movie. Pirates was an adult adventure film from 2005. Yes, the year after she appeared in a kid's movie, she found herself appearing at the other end of the spectrum. Scenes were shot on Bounty while she was out in the Gulf near St. Pete. It's thought that the owners of the ship were not aware of the true nature of the film as they were advised that the film being made was, quote, a Disney-type pirate film for families. At the very least, all the scenes filmed on board were PG. Oddly enough, Bounty's next movie was quite literally a Disney pirate film for families. Walt Disney Studios' second movie in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, 2006's Dead Man's Chest, starred Johnny Depp, Keira Knightley, and Orlando Bloom. Bounty portrayed the Edinburgh Trader and was one of four sailing ships used for the movie. Dead Man's Chest would easily be the most successful movie Bounty appeared in. As of 2023, it's earned over a billion dollars. 
Bounty was also featured in the 1960s Flipper TV series in the episode Flipper and the Bounty. In 1993, Ted Turner donated the ship to the Fall River Chamber Foundation in Massachusetts, which established the Tall Ship Bounty Foundation to operate the ship for educational adventures and as a tourist attraction. Bounty summered in New England waters, operating in Fall River's Heritage State Park and wintered in St. Pete. Bounty would go through restoration work, and in 2001, she was sold to the HMS Bounty Foundation. In 2007, after completing another restoration, Bounty made a seven-week UK tour, including a visit to Maryport in northwest England, the birthplace of Fletcher Christian. Later, she embarked on a tour to South Africa, New Zealand, Tahiti, and Pitcairn, the original Bounty's ports of call. In October 2012, Bounty left New London, Connecticut on a heading for St. Pete. Coming northward at the same time was Hurricane Sandy. Bounty was aware of the cyclone and initially took an easterly course to avoid it. At some point, Captain Robin Walbridge changed course and for some reason headed directly into Sandy's Pass. On October 29, Bounty sent out a distress call to which the U.S. Coast Guard responded. Located about 90 miles or 140 kilometers southeast of Cape Hatteras, Bounty was foundering and the captain said she was taking on water. Shortly after midnight, she was discovered by the crew of a Coast Guard C-130 plane. At this point, she was listing at about 45 degree angle on her starboard side. The C-130 would circle the doomed ship while helicopter crews prepared for a very difficult rescue operation. At 4.45 a.m., the first mate radioed that Bounty was sinking and that they needed immediate assistance. The C-130 dropped life rafts, but had to leave the area low on fuel. This left a 16-member crew on their own in rough seas and a nearly hurricane-force wind. Fourteen of the crew were rescued by Coast Guard helicopters. During the operation, one of the rescuers was seriously injured. Hours later, a 15th crew member was found, but was pronounced dead. Captain Walbridge was the final missing person. Like the rest of the crew, he wore an orange survival suit with a strobe light, but after a 90-hour search, he was declared lost. In a formal investigation, it was concluded that Captain Walbridge's decision to sail the ship into the path of Hurricane Sandy was the cause, calling it a reckless decision. It was also found that the captain's decision to abandon ship came much too late, which likely caused his death along with the other crew member. The original Bounty was launched in 1784 and was put to the torch at Pitcairn only six short years later. Certainly a sad ending for one of the most famous ships in history. The new Bounty's end was also sad. Any ship that sinks with a loss of life is a tragedy. Still, it could look to a proud and useful life of 52 years with tens of thousands of miles sailed and visits to dozens of countries across much of the globe. The story of the Nova Scotian ship, hand-built by skilled shipwrights using 176-year-old plans, is a remarkable one. After her initial purpose, she'd go on to impress the crowds at the 1964 New York World's Fair and then spent the majority of her life in St. Petersburg as one of the Florida's many unique attractions. MGM's Bounty exhibit is still fondly remembered by many, and her sinking in Hurricane Sandy is a loss to many fans. Thank you for watching another of my videos. If you learned something, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.